Welcome to the Configure It Done podcast. The Configure It Done podcast is a place where successful thought leaders in the SAP space come to share their leadership styles, their tips, and their unique stories on how to run successful large-scale SAP programs. Listen to the podcast to learn from their successes, their failures, their career stories, and their inspirations. This podcast is in partnership with the Black Dog Institute, who aim to create a mentally healthier world for everyone. If you wish to support the cause, please donate via the link below. Welcome, welcome everybody to season three. Uh, this is episode five. Uh, my colleague Bethany, she's back with us. Um, she was on the last series. And uh, Bethany, you've brought along a, a fantastic guest today. So I'm going to hand you over to yourself, Bethany, to uh, introduce your guest. Okay, perfect. So um, I met Alex um, well over a year ago now, virtually because COVID, um, and was instantly drawn to um, Alex, your particular leadership style. So I feel like um, during COVID, the leadership style conversations have changed a lot, but you, from my understanding, have always led in a really empathetic and people-driven way, even before it was um, I suppose, a necessity or a trend. So um, that's one of the reasons that I wanted to invite you along to the podcast today um, to talk about your leadership style. Um, you've spoken a lot about how you win the hearts and minds of your consultants and how you do that. Um, and we've also touched on sort of different ways to attract consultants to firms right now and what consultants can do to really put their best foot forward, which I think is a conversation that hasn't been had as often over the last couple of years, what consultants can do for firms. So um, that's one of the reasons I wanted to invite you along to the podcast today. Excellent. Thanks, Thank Bethany, and thanks, Jay, for the great opportunity. No problem. All right, so I'm sure there's not many people in the market that don't know you, Alex, um, but for those of you that don't, how we normally start the podcast is do a, a quick fire question round. Um, so it takes three or four minutes um, and I'm going to hand you over to Bethany. She's going to run through a few questions just to get to know you as a as a person. So, yeah, over to you, Bethany, if you wanted to start the quick fire question round. Perfect. OK, what is your full name? Hmm. Alexander Antonio Andrenacci Ampola. I knew it was going to be long. <laughs> what is your nickname if you have one? Uh, no, I don't have one, but the shortest version of my name is Al, A-L. That's the shortest way that people call me. That's this easier to right. it's easier to spell than the full name. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> I was so excited about asking you full name, honestly. Um, and where were you from originally? I was born in Venezuela, but uh, my parents are Italians. But uh, depending on the type of question situation, I may say that I'm from Venezuela or Italy depending on which way you want the conversation to sway. Exactly yeah. right. If it's food related, I got out the Italian way. If it's party related, dancing <laughs> and music, I will go the Venezuelan way. Oh, that's smart, I like it. Um, how long have you been in Australia? 24 years. Love it. Where are you currently working? Um, well, at home. Um, I left Accenture um, during the COVID period. I joined EY during the COVID period. So actually I've been at home all along, but um, really having a lot of fun. Yeah, love it. Um, and what is your favorite podcast, if you have one? Yes, um, there is a um, psychologist called Esther Perel, and her podcast is Highs Work. And actually, it's interesting that you um, were talking about empathy because that podcast is all about relationships at work and how how we need to continue to work with the empathy and the people aspect, not only at home with our people and families and, and sort of people that we live in the same room, but also with people at work. So great podcast. Perfect. I just wrote it down. I'm very excited to listen to that one. Um, what's your favorite book? Look, I don't have a favorite book, but I love autobiographies. Um, Richard Branson, Elon Musk, uh, Barack Obama. So any autobiography that uh, sort of I can I can read, I'll read it. I love it. Simon, our director, is actually the same because you can learn a lot from high performing autobiographies, can't you? Um, favorite music or film, either one or both. Film, keeping the faith. I'm, I'm a very positive person, so I always think that keeping the faith is good. Love it. Favorite restaurant? Mm, anything Italian. <laughs> uh, we'll fall into the category. <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, favorite destination? Greece. Um, for holidays, beach, but uh, Italy, Rome, 
is my dream city. Um, I could go to Italy um, 20 times more in my life and I will never, never stop loving it. Mm, especially now, that sounds good. Um, what, uh, if you could describe your management style in one word, what would that be? Collaborative. Collaborative. Bucket list thing to do. Uh, I want to go to Cuba. Cuba. And if you weren't in SAP, what would you be doing instead? Uh, I've always said that if I was not in SAP, I would be owning a restaurant uh, or something related with food, which I almost have because I have a food truck. But that's not the point. That's not the question. And uh, or I will be working uh, uh, on an airline service first class customers because I love traveling. Uh, but I didn't want to serve economy class people. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> I wanted very few people to serve. <laughs> that's understandable. Um, and I feel like you've given us so many fun facts already now. But can you tell us a fun fact about yourself? Uh, well, I have a food truck. Um, something that I didn't think I was going to have, but my passion for food and Venezuelan food is something that I wanted to bring to Australia. So mm. three years ago, um, I sort of created uh, that food truck. It's been uh, sort of in the garage during COVID, but it's going to come out back in, in January. So, And it's because it's the experience. Every transaction, every sale that I make, I hear the story of someone that comes and approaches the truck and buy an arepa. And because it's not something that people know what it is, they ask questions and we engage in a conversation. So great, great. How do, great. You, how do you find the time to, to do that? Obviously, you, you and your position <laughs> would, would be very time consuming. But yeah, that, that's amazing. How do you define the time? Jay, when 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 I am cooking on the grill, the arepas, all the things that happened during the prior week uh, are gone. I don't I don't think about it. it's actually distressing. Um, I, I find that uh, I totally recharge for the following week. Yeah. So yes, okay. um, I do need to find more time though. <laughs> <laughs> have you have you seen the movie Chef? I have. I have, yeah. yes. I saw that the other day. That's the first thing I thought of when you said you forget about time and that's relaxing and yeah, really good yeah. movie. Yeah, no, it is fucking fantastic. I I, I brought the, the truck uh, to my house on the 20th of November with the EY team. Um, it was a way to actually um, sort of explore freedom in the state of Victoria, but also to get together on something that they were not sort of exposed to. And it was a great experience. So I had everyone on the truck cooking and serving. So it was actually quite fun. All right, Jay, we need a food truck now. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's making me hungry. It's only yeah, 10 o'clock where I'm hungry already. <laughs> All right. So Alex, let's get into the the, the crux of the, uh, the podcast. Um, I'd love to firstly understand and, and and how did you first discover and develop your leadership style? Um, look, Jay, I mean, I feel, and I always say this, I feel that I am who I am today because of the time and investment that people made on me. Right? And I think that to me is how leadership style are formed. Right? And basically, I guess, learning, adapting and adopting some of the things that are unique in you but passing it back and actually continue to share that. Well, so, so, so that's why, um, and there's people, you know, throughout my career. Uh, and look, I spent 27 years at Accenture and I've been uh, with UI only 15 months, right? So I gotta say that Accenture was the place where all those role models were, right? Whether I was in Caracas when I started my job, uh, or it was then in Australia where I spent the majority of my time, or in Singapore, where I spent 10 years in between. I think in, in, in all of those places, there were people that really spent time and invested time on me. And they gave me feedback um, on the spot. Uh, and I remember those individuals that after the meeting or the orals or the uh, client presentation, they took five minutes to give me the feedback um, uh, immediately. And to me, that is important, right? Because that's how we learn, right? You know, a year later to say, I remember what you didn't do. I mean, it's too late, right? So I was lucky. I think I was lucky that I always had people that sort of took me along the journey, uh, gave me rope uh, for me to do things and learn and make mistakes, but they always provided me the coaching. Yeah, sure, sure. Hey, have you got a um, like a story of a, a leader and 
you know, something that they give you that you hold gospel now and you do pass on? Uh, is there any like specific, um, specific things that you've been taught? Yeah, look, they, okay, there's a couple of, of things. I mean, uh, one of our partners, uh, Lisa Mascolo, uh, she um, she used used to say that the best career advice was ask for help. Uh, and to me, uh, and I use that every day, right? ask for help doesn't mean that you're not good enough. It means that actually you recognize that you need help and you can and you need to grow more. Right? Uh, and I continuously sort of push that to people to say, continue to raise your hand and ask for help. That's number one. Uh, number two is um, acknowledge that, and I say this, superheroes only exist in movies. Uh, so don't try to be the single person uh, because you build, you will become the single point of failure right, if something goes wrong. So uh, and that's why I got with a collaboration approach, really bring people together. Uh, and I've always built teams because I think the power of teams is where things do happen. Uh, and the last one is never ask for permission, ask for forgiveness. Um, and, and it was this partner from our um, office in Miami who one day saw me a little bit upset and uh, he said, what happened, Alex? And I said, oh, something had happened. One of my counselees didn't get his approve, uh, his training approved. And he said, why? I said, oh, because I went and asked. And I said, what did you ask? If you're doing the right thing for the firm, for the company, or for the, the employee, then no one will sack you. Right. So it's better to ask for forgiveness um, than ask for permission. So there you I've go. never heard that before, but I absolutely love it. That that's brilliant. That's so insightful. My um my grandmother used to say that about purchasing things, <laughs> <laughs> which is which is a very different conversation. But I, I really like that though because um I think one of the common misconceptions with those that are really successful is that it takes like this level of perfection when really it takes making a series of failures, learning from them, and then building on that success and also taking opportunities. Because if you only take the one opportunity, you know, once every few months or once a year, then you miss out on everything. So, I mean, I suppose that that's a good interpretation is ask for forgiveness and and just take opportunities while you can. Um, I love what you said as well about, it reminds me of Dunning's-Kruger effect, basically the, the first thing that you said, because if you are asking for help consistently, um, it's it's a really good way to avoid thinking that you know everything, isn't it? Because the more you ask for help, the more you get information about as many different topics as possible, because you can't be an expert at everything. That's such good insight. Um, so when we spoke a few weeks ago, you spoke a lot about winning the hearts and minds of your team, um, which is something that I love. So how do you do that? Do you take different personalities into account? I mean, what, what does that look like for you? Uh, look, I mean, I... Probably I spend more time talking to people that actually having calls uh, for internal purposes, right? And, and the reason why I do that is because I feel that the only way that I can provide individuals, uh, and, and and we need to talk about individuals, right? Uh, we cannot manage careers of teams, right? And, and I think that's probably one of the challenges where we try to be the super boss of a hundred people. You cannot provide tender love and care to 100 people. You can only provide the necessary attention to a small group. Right? And that's why it's important to have sort of enough leaders in the organization that have the ability to spend time with the subgroups to really care, understand, uh, believe, support, uh, challenge, um, you know, do all the things that you need to do at the individual level. Right? Um, and we have many, many cases. I mean, there was there's a case now uh, Adi Y, one of my colleagues, uh, she's leaving us uh, because she always wanted to work in, in a strategy firm. However, I said to her uh, nine months ago, the time is not now. The time is probably in nine months time uh, at the end of the year when we've got things ready. And it was an easy conversation because I knew her intent, I knew her purpose and I knew her mission. Right? And we were able to accommodate both her needs and my needs. Right? And I think it's easy to do that rather than get upset because she's leaving. Right? I, and, and that's what I, that's what I refer to We need the hearts and minds. It's about really understanding each individual. Right? Uh, and there are things that sometimes may not be possible. Sometimes they are possible. So I think it's about balancing that. Second, I think empowerment. I think understanding the hearts and minds is really give people the opportunity to grow in an area where they feel they're strong at and give them one hobby. 
I always said that you needed to have two things in your hand. One that you're really, really good at, and one that you're exploring, you're learning, you you have a little bit of passion. Right? And that, that was my career. I was sort of a FICO cons consultant, financial uh, financials and controlling, but I had BI business intelligence. Huh? And today I can talk about both uh, equally, right? but I always had two things in my hand. So to me, that is important. Excellent. Uh, and then focusing on your, your team, um, there, Ale, obviously I'm hearing that come through and what you're saying, like you, a lot of team focus around it, but how do you um, give back to your team um, when giving them feedback? Um, look, time is, time is the problem, but I think if you don't have time for care for people, then you don't have time to leave. <laughs> um, I mean, that's, that's basic, right? And the other day, actually, um, went for lunch with a group of uh, colleagues and they said, uh, oh, Alex, you're very, you're much more approachable now at EY than at Accenture. And, and it's not because, uh, but it's not because I'm a different person, right? It's because I have a small, a smaller team, right? And I have enjoyed that. I have enjoyed the opportunity to spend personal time with individuals on their opportunities and challenges, right? And how do I give back? Um, I think, my, I'm known for uh, overfeeding of information. There's nothing that reaches my inbox that I don't pass on. Because no? actually my inbox doesn't get bigger or better. Oh, it's worth more by me keeping information. No? So I continuously you know, push information down. Because the day we stop learning, that day, I think we're ready to die. Well, I think learning needs to be on a daily basis. And it's hard because, again, time, right? But I feel that we can make time for things that make us grow. And to me, that's that's how that's how I push my kids to learn, right? I said, uh, you know, learning uh, is not just because you need to do it, but because you're gaining something out of it, right? So, so, so how do we balance that? But I, I share. Uh, I'm a sherry person. <laughs> mm -hmm. I feel like I'm seeing some of the Italian passion come through now. <laughs> <laughs> the day that you're not learning is the day that you're ready to die. That's that's an intense. Absolutely. It's true. It's true. I love that. Um, so we, we spoke um, a little bit earlier about um, graduate programs and, and newer SAP consultants as well. Um, if you could give any advice for young or for new SAP consultants that are entering into the consultancy domain, what advice would you give? How do they put their best foot forward and really add value? Look, I, and sort of times have changed, uh, Bethany. When I, when I started in the SAP world was in 1992 and um, I sort of, I went to a, my first SAP project without any knowledge and uh, the partner at the time told me that I was going to be the accounts payable expert. They gave me three binders, half in German, half in Spanish, and there you go. Well, today, if I have a new grad and I send them to a project, if the second day the grad will come back and say, I am not capable, I don't want to do this, I, please change my role. And I think that is the problem. <laughs> the problem is that, um, and I use the lens of my kids, right? My kids have had a relatively easy life. They, when they have problems, they go to YouTube and solve problem solved, right? Uh, I didn't have YouTube, right? I had to work every day till three in the morning to catch up with the, with the SAP screens. So I think there is two ways that I would like to see the new generation sort of embracing. Um, SAP and and look at EY. I call SAP SAP Plus, right? Because I know there is a stigma that SAP is all is horrible. Has got the same screens from 1972. So what is fun about it? Well, you know, it's better if I do some digital work, right? But to be honest, I always say that SAP is the spinal cord of the enterprises and the stronger we make it, the easier it will be to connect with other things, digital, beautiful portals, platforms, API layers, I mean, anything you want, right? And I think that's where we need to get the new SAP consultant. The new SAP consultant shouldn't be about the digital core, right? It should be about actually the whole surrounding. And I was talking yesterday with one of our colleagues, and because one of my missions in life, uh, and I will not um, 
uh, I will not die before I do this, is be able to to, to think and think with people on tomorrow's processes, on tomorrow's technology, and sort of have the ability to, to really do things that we don't, we don't do today. I mean, there is nothing stopping us to, to measure the carbon uh, footprint on a asset deactivation. Let's say that we shut down a plant. There will be things that will be gone to landfill. There will be things that will be recycled. There will be things that will be reused. If we manage the carbon footprint of all of that, we could potentially be very creative and say, this is the impact to the planet. Now, reality is that we could have done that many years ago, because right? actually nothing has changed. It's just now we talk about sustainability. Right? So I want to start doing things today so that when my kids uh, uh, in you know in my position they can benefit from this the, the changes that we're making today right so i think the sap consultant of the future is not about an sap module it's not about an sap it's about a domain it's about a future process it's about a future business right mm -hmm. and the principal of my kids school when we were in singapore said something that i always remember which is we're teaching these kids sort of skills and an and ability for jobs that don't exist today. Uh, and I think that's exactly, we need to give the SAP consultants the equipment, the toolkit, the toolbox for things that actually are yet to be discovered. So how would you do that, Ale? How would you change someone's mindset? If, if, if you're a grad and you're looking at all these cool, sexy new products and you're looking at SAP, like how, do you, how would you influence or change someone's mindset? Or do you even need to do that? No, look, um, let's use the analogy because I'm the analogy. Let's use the analogy of a Tesla car. Yes, Tesla has got um, a beautiful, has got no engine or no combustion engine, but has got steel tires, has got steel uh, windscreen. So the basics must exist. So I always tell people, because Jay, I mean, you know how many times new grads have come to me after two months blueprinting to say, I've done enough blueprinting. I will. So what's next for me? And I look at the person and I say, what do you mean I've, you've done enough blueprinting? I've done blueprinting for 27 years of my life. And every blueprint is different because the situation is different, the client is different. So how do we change? I think it's by, by enhancing the end solution so that it's not necessarily that squarely box SAP screen that I guess I saw and I was only able to work with these, those boundaries, right? right? Right now, the boundaries don't exist huh? because it's actually, they are more elastic, let, okay, let me say. But also because the flexibility of technology to get today really allows young people to do cool stuff like building, building simulation or artificial intelligence modules within the traditional SAP environment and still providing cool solutions to client. Right. And I think that's that's where, again, we need to expand. Right? The SAP consultant of the 90s was the one who knew every single transaction in FI, CO, SD, MN, PP. The SAP consultant of 2025 is the consultant that knows how to best do be, can be the best asset sort of um, value creator almost like how do I create value out of what we do and, and and Jay, I think it's not only about technology, it's all about behaviors and people. Because I always use the example, when I implemented HANA in 2014, we were doing this uh, for a company in Thailand and they make brick. A brick doesn't smell good, doesn't look good, it's just a brick, right? But because the water prices in Thailand are, are volatile and based on supply and demand. They're not fixed. Um, by implementing HANA and us collecting water prices on a real-time basis, finance all of a sudden was able to predict and forecast the price, the cost of manufacturing of that brick when the water prices were high versus when the water prices were low. And by just having that ability to link these, they, they became the business partners to supply chain and they were able 
I mean, they were able to sit down with supply chain and say, instead of making those bricks at 10 a.m. today to deliver them this afternoon, why don't we make them tonight? Call your customer so we can still deliver the bricks, but it's cost us less to make them. Right now, this is 2014, so so we didn't have to have the technology of 2021. Right, but guess what? Still today, sometimes we don't make enough changes with the people and the behaviors to drive that value. Right, so that's why I feel uh, I would love to have another 30 years at EY, so I can do as much as I did at Accenture. That's amazing. So I was going to say, um, we. We, we ask this question a lot and it's such a difficult question because it requires a lot of vulnerability, but you are so good, I think, at um, at being empathetic and vulnerable with your team. So I think this is the perfect question for you. So can you describe your biggest failure and what you learned from it? I fail every day. <laughs> uh, I can tell you that. Um, Don't fail. Um, uh, look. There were moments in life that I felt um, that I was experiencing things for the first time. Um, I always work on projects that went roughly on time, and when that project uh, in 1990, in 2005 actually didn't go live as planned, um, I felt shattered. I felt that the world was crumbling and I was incompetent because uh, I wasn't able to stop or change the direction. So um, I think the, the failures have have taught me that actually the things that I can control and the things that I cannot. Uh, and I think um, that's always that's probably the biggest learning from the things from the failures is that there's there's so much that I can control and I, I shouldn't feel bad about things that I cannot control. Uh, um, and I get that feeling when we lose a beat or a proposal. Well, because I know that we did everything that we should have done. Well, I never, I never feel that we could have done something else and we didn't do it. Well, so, um, but there are things that I can control and things that I cannot control. Okay, excellent. So I'm going to um, cast your mind um, back to probably when you were at Accenture. Um, who's been who's been the biggest influence in your your career? Um, Alex, and, and what did they teach you? Um, look, uh, Accenture, well, still has many of them because they haven't retired. Um, incredible partners that um, throughout the life uh, of my 27 years there, sort of, um, they shaped me. Well, um, so John Caney, for example, um, I was about to be a father for my first child, and I was living in Albury, Budonga, which is not uh, close to Melbourne. And uh, I had lunch with him, uh, and I remember Melbourne Central, and uh, he said to me, look, Alex, uh, Accenture will never tap on your shoulder and say, oh, you're working very hard. You're you're going to be a father soon. You should come to Melbourne. Uh, it's you who needs to raise your hand and say, you know, please, Accenture, help me. Uh, um, and it's one of those things that I always do because, uh, again, he says, you're, you've done enough for the firm. The firm now needs to support you in what you want and what you need. Uh, so those things, I mean, they make an impact on me. Uh, um, uh, I mean, uh, John Zilli, um, he was the clan account partner for Unke Unilever globally. And he flew from London to Singapore. Uh, we were preparing the 70 pages presentation for the orals and he comes Got, walks into the office and says, we're going to take one page. And everyone looking around and saying, what do you mean you take one page? Yes, we're going to pay the people page because Unilever will buy this program because of those 20 people that are going to drive this, not because the other 70 pages that tells them that we're good at running and doing an SAP program that we've done this before. Well, it's all about the people. Uh, and it's something that at that point in time, I thought it was crazy. We had spent three days preparing 70 <laughs> pages of PowerPoint. Right? So those things that help shape in terms of what's important, right? And what's important is not about the content, right? It's, it's about who you are. What do you bring to the firm? What do you bring to the team? What are you going to do to me? Right? And I always, always tell look at my people, if you were a client, would you buy what we're selling? Right? Because sometimes we consultants trying to be smarter uh, and use uh, many wonderful words to say nothing, uh, uh, and I and I keep 
keep pushing that. I mean, put yourself, one day you might be a client. Right? Um, and look, Accenture had a beautiful trading center in St. Charles, and I went many times there. And we used to hire former clients, and it was this individual client who he was always, we had a sort of a simulation session, and the first meeting uh, sort of uh, in a simulated environment was about ice breaking. So the team didn't know the person, and this particular individual had pictures and things sitting on a uh, place on his desk. And so many times people came and ignored what it was in his days, didn't care about him as a person, but say, oh, I came here because my boss told me that I needed to talk about the project. Huh? And, 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 and in that meeting, and I watched about 50 of these meetings and I learned from every single one of them. Because things like, for example, I say, look, there's a picture there of my grandkids, ask me a question, because if that picture is there, it's for a reason. It's not because I didn't have a space in my house and I put it on my desk. Right? <laughs> and he said, understand the person. He said, yeah, the, remember me as a client? Understand me. And he used to say this to our young senior managers. When you go on a, your first day, do you take PowerPoints and you say, and you take notes, what's your name? Because he says, it's the first meeting. I see people taking notes. What are you, what are you taking notes about? You're here to, to meet me, to get to know me. And you don't take PowerPoints when you go on your first date. So don't take a notepad uh, when you get to mommy. So look, my, again, learning. I, I think the most enjoyable part of my life has been the fact that I've learned from so many people and it's still today. I can pass that on and can, you know, sort of uh, replay those moments. You know, it seems like, um... Uh, like when it comes to to management style and just individual style as well, you either learn because you didn't have a good leader and they treated you badly and so you completely do a 180 and you, and you learn what they didn't do well and you change it, or you have this series of amazing leaders and you're able to sort of pick and choose what they do. I, I feel like you've had a lot of the latter. It sounds like you've had so many really good leaders in front of you that be, you've been able to take notes from, as well as just being a passionate person yourself and and wanting to lead your team well. Yeah, that's true. But but look, something that um, I nothing was given to me sort of for free. Right? I mean, there was one year uh, not yeah. too long ago, by the way, in Accenture, when my boss uh, Fabio said to me, "You're only going to receive fifty percent of your annual bonus because you had a challenge in this particular part of your performance," um, and it was fair. It was clear and understood, and I knew what my level of responsibility and accountability was. Right? Um, now, you know, Fabi is a person that I will consider him a friend, you know, we've cooked together. You know, so, so, so I think it's, that is important. I think leadership uh, doesn't have to be all good news. Right? And I feel, and I feel that sometimes, um, you know, it's hard for people to have these conversations. Right? But I feel that if you are, strong enough and if you have the trust and you have the respect it's okay to have that, these conversations mm -hmm. it's nothing wrong right? so i respect individuals like fabio that uh you know without any remorse <laughs> deliver the message <laughs> <laughs> i love that um if you could give any advice to your 21 year old self what would it be uh <laughs> look i would say I don't say follow your passion because I think passion, you bring it with you. Right? I, th I think uh, I think passion is something that you embody in in things that you do or you create. Um, to me, is never never be fully satisfied, complete that you know for things that are you know never take for granted. Everything is complete, hundred percent. Always, always think that, that you can do something different to come something better, right? And I think that's the challenge. I mean, the challenge that I put on my teams is every day, they, there are different ways and, and different avenues that we can reach that, right? Um, the fact that um, accounts payable is accounts payable or payrolls is payroll. I mean, doesn't mean that we need to continue that same process, that same behavior forever, right? Um, I've got a problem. When I get an email 
asking me to approve someone's annual leave. You tell me, Bethany, what value do I add? Would I be able, would, would I stop someone going on annual leave? No. Would I create a big problem if I cancel someone on annual leave? Yes. So what value that does process have? But so many companies in the world today still <laughs> yeah. send me that reminder. So that's what I said. Is, so let's challenge that. Let's take that out of our life because it doesn't add any value. Right? And I think we need to be brave and we need to just take the leap of faith and sort of sort of uh, agree that actually those are the changes that we need to drive for the future generation. Brilliant. So, so Alex, it was actually um, Cameron Berkman that asked us to approach you to come onto the the podcast, and I know you've um, you've worked with a lot of fantastic people in your career. So, thank you first of all for coming on the podcast today. But what I'd love to know is um, who else would you like to hear um, on the podcast? Look, um, it's sad what I'm going to say, but it's ha but but it's happy. I mean, Donna and Verga. I mean. Donna is someone that has worked with me for many, many years um, in Accenture Australia. Then she moved to the US and I continue to support her. I used to see her at Orlando for Sapphire in the SAP conferences. Uh, when she came back from the US, she gave me a call and uh, we transferred her into Melbourne. Um, she moved to EY, I follow her, and now she's moving to Bain. Um, but I think she's an amazing an amazing person uh, with uh, huge potential, uh, a lot of energy, and definitely uh, smarter than me. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but many, 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 many hundreds of miles. So, Donna Enberga. Excellent. Alex, that was an absolute pleasure. Um, thank you for sharing all those insights, those stories. Um, I think anyone listening to this is going to learn a lot from from you and, and your passion and your energy and the way you come across. So I'm sure Bethany would agree, but thank you very much for, for coming on the podcast today. No worries at all, Jay. It's my pleasure. And look, uh, it's all about sharing, again, passing on the wealth uh, of experiences that I have uh, received. Love Excellent. that. Thank you, Alex.